Okay, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to, in to introduce Paul Zagorski today. He's from Warsaw University of Technology, and his topic today is quasi-polynomial time algorithm for independent sets and related problem EPT free graph. Paul, thanks for speak today. Okay, thank you very much, and I'm very happy to uh, to give a talk at your seminar. Uh, it, it became quite easy now uh, with no traveling. Uh, okay, mm, so let's go to the topic. So I, I'm going to show some results that are all rather fresh and uh, they are obtained as a joint work with uh, Peter Gartland, uh, Daniel Lokstanov, uh, Michał Pilipczuk, and Marcin Pilipczuk uh, and myself. Mm, and I'm going to talk about uh, the complexity of uh, finding independent sets in uh, some graph classes. Mm, and if we have time, I will uh, talk a bit about other problems as well, but my main focus will be independent set. So, okay, what is independent set? I will just write miss maximum independent set, we ask for the maximum size or maximum weight, a set of pairwise in, in um, uh, non-adjacent vertices. And I will focus on the non-weighted variant. So I will ask for the maximum size solution, but everything I say will apply to the weighted variant and, uh, and it will apply in an easy way. I will just uh, to simplify um, the exposition. So we know that uh, independent set problem is, is hard. It's one of the classical hard problems and it's hard in, in many different senses of this word. It's, it's uh, NP hard, it's uh, hard, it's very hard to approximate. It's uh, hard in the param from the parameterized complexity point of view. Um, so if we want to have some hope to, to solve independent set uh, efficiently, we need to agree that, well, we cannot have everything. So one of the things that we could um, somehow give up on is uh, generality. So I will talk about independent set in special graph classes. Uh, so I will say, okay, I'm, I'm not willing to solve independent set in all graphs, but what if my graph has some special structure? Maybe then the problem becomes easier. And the graph classes that I'm going to discuss are H3. So H is, is a graph. Uh, so H3 meaning that they do not contain H as an induced subgraph. So here induced is very important. So for example, um, Okay, this graph, uh, this graph is not P4 free because I have a four vertex path here, uh, but for example, this graph is P4 free. It's, um, so, um, ah, and by P4 or just PT, uh, I mean a path on T vertices. Mm, so what can we say about those classes? So uh, as we can see in this picture, they are not closed under uh, edge deletion. So the graph on the right is of P4 free, but I can delete one edge and obtain an induced P4, but they are closed under vertex deletion. So this is a very important property that I will use many times. Uh, I will not recall it explicitly, but uh, I will remove many vertices from my graphs. So it's important that they uh, still have this property. Uh, so we can ask, what is the property of independent set in H3 graphs? And uh, unfortunately, uh, the problem doesn't become much easier. And uh, for most cases, at least, um, there is a classical result by Alexeyev which says that if H is, ah, and also like one simplification, it's not a very important simplification, but uh, just to 
uh, keep the exposition easier, I will always assume that uh, H is connected. Um, so if we talk about connected graphs, Alexeyev proved that if H is not a path or it's not a subdivided claw. And what is a subdivided claw? It's, it's a graph that looks roughly like this. Uh, so it's built of three paths that are glued by one endpoint. So Alexeyev proved that if H is not of this form, uh, then maximum independent set is NP hard in H free graphs. And this is actually very easy because um, the, there are two things to prove. One is that, okay, the problem is difficult uh, when your graph has maximum degree three. So if your graph H contains a large degree vertex, then of course, a graph with maximum degree three is H free. So, so we have our hardness. And the second part is the observation that if you have an edge and you subdivide it twice, so you perform this type of transformation. So this, those are the original vertices of your graph. And then, well, the size of the independent set grows, but it grows in a, in a well-behaving way. So it, um, it grows by one. So when I do this on every edge, a constant number of time of times I still have an equivalent instance but if I do it a sufficiently large number of times I can prevent a cycle and a fixed cycle and I can prevent uh, two vertices of degree three at, at any fixed distance so this way I can exclude all others graph H uh, so really the interesting cases are H is a path or H is a subdivided claw. Mm. And well, it's, uh, we know very little actually. So for paths, we know that the problem is polynomial time solvable for, for five vertex path and for six vertex path. So, I mean, for graphs that exclude a six vertex uh, path as an induced subgraph. And this is uh, very fresh. It's uh, soda from uh, 2019, I, I, I think. For subdivided clause, we, we know that the problem is uh, polynomial time solvable for the claw graph. And for the next simplest case, and that's basically all we know if it comes to polynomial time algorithms. Uh, so maybe the problem is hard, but uh, on the other hand, we don't know any hardness proofs. So uh, we can uh, state it in a different way that of all hardness proofs or all NP-hardness proofs of independent set that we know, all of them produce long induced paths. Uh, and by long, I mean uh, larger than any constant. We, we don't know any um, reduction that does not produce long induced paths. Um, and uh, in my talk, I will focus on the case that H is a path. So I will not discuss subdivided clause. Um, and uh, well, this is all we know if it comes to polynomial time uh, solvability. But uh, if we are a bit more modest, we ask for some uh, some weaker uh, variant of efficiency, we can do something. And uh, the something is that uh, I want to mention two results. The first one is that we can um, solve the problem in sub-exponential time. Uh, so, and this uh, means here that it's uh, root n log n. And n is of course the number of vertices. And this is uh, Bacho et al. And um, also the problem has a cupitas. So the problem could be very well approximated uh, if we have a, a quasi polynomial time. And this is by Maria and her co authors. And this is also very fresh. This is Soda 2020. Mm. So, uh, well, of course, this 
can be seen as some evidence that the problem is easier, but it's it's not very definite evidence. It's still possible that the problem is NP hard, but uh, some of those uh, algorithms exist. Mm, but uh, let me show you uh, this quasi polynomial time algorithm. Uh, is this uh, sorry sub exponential time algorithm? And uh, because it is very nice and uh, it will serve as a starting point to uh, what I'm going to show next. Mm, the crucial thing, the crucial combinatorial observation is the lemma by uh, Andras Jarfash. And uh, it's um, roughly, it says roughly this, if G is PT free, then there exists a subset of vertices of G uh, such that every component of G minus closed neighborhood of X. So I remove X and all vertices that have a neighbor in X. Uh, every component has at most N half vertices. Uh, and uh, X is small and uh, it's at most T. Actually, it, it, it's, it could be even T minus one, but uh, it's not important for us. So I have a small size set whose neighborhood, when I remove the, the set and the neighborhood, uh, I can split the graph into small pieces. And uh, the argument here is very simple and very elegant. I will just sketch it. So we can start with uh, and a vertex. So this is the neighborhood of this vertex. So if all components here are small, and by small I mean they have at most n half vertices, then we are done. Then we found a small set such that when I remove it and its neighborhood, then I split the graph into small components. So assume that it's not the case. Uh, so there are some components that are large, but there could be a one large component. One component can be of size uh, at least half of the vertices. Yeah. And I have a bunch of small components. So I choose a vertex here in the neighborhood that is adjacent to this component. And I continue. So I I look at the neighbor. So, okay, let's call them V1, V2. Now I look at the neighbors of V2. So, um, they are like this. And I ask, so if all components of the remaining graph are small, then I'm done. I found a graph of uh, a set of size two, who, such that when I remove the set and its neighborhood, uh, then um, all components are small. And if not, I continue this way. And notice that by this construction, the vertices that I select uh, form an induced path because I can, I can have no edges from say V1 uh, somewhere here because all neighbors of V1 are in this layer and I have selected exactly one vertex from this layer. So since my graph doesn't have long induced paths, at, after at most T steps I will finish and I will split the graph into small components. And uh, how can we um, exploit this algorithmically uh, it's actually quite simple and very elegant. So let's consider two cases. The first case is that there exists a vertex V such that the degree V of V is uh, larger than root N. Mm, such a vertex is, is very good for branching. Uh, so I can, so what do I mean by this? I can guess whether this vertex V belongs to my solution or not. If it doesn't belong to my solution, I just remove it from my graph. I don't get too much progress. I get some progress. I, I don't stay at the same place as I was, but um, um, I, it's not a great progress. But when I decide to include V in my solution, I remove V and I can remove all the neighbors of V from my graph. So the recursion I get is of this type. So in this first branch, I have very little progress. In the second branch, I have a big progress. And this branching solves to n to, oh, to root n. So I'll just write it this way. 
Mm, so after this branching, after I finished this step, I have produced this many instances and each of them has a degree at most uh, root n. Okay, so the second case is that uh, the maximum degree is at most root n. So I find the set x from the lemma and I observe that the closed neighborhood of x is uh, it's roughly mm, t times root n because I have at most t vertices and each of them has degree uh, root n. So, so this is my separator n of x. I have a bunch of other components here. And what I can do, I can just guess the intersection of the solution with, uh, with the separator. I have at most two to the size of the separator, meaning t times root n possibilities. And I recurse mm, two components. And when we solve it, again, we uh, get this uh, complexity two to here. I think I, I even get this without logarithm. So I have at most, uh, so I have two to root n log n instances. Each of them can be solved in time two to root n. So this all gives me the running time like this. Mm. So this is all very simple and very, very nice, I think. Um, let me point out that uh, by this uh, hardness result by Alexeyev, such a thing is not possible for anything, if we forbid anything that is not a path or, or a subdivided claw. So uh, such a sub-exponential time algorithm is not possible. Uh, let me point out uh, two crucial things that were here. Uh, so uh, two intuitions that we will use later. The first intuition is that if we have a branching like this, uh, we have, we remove some vertices and in one branch, we remove very little, but something. And in a second branch or, or all other branches, actually, we remove quite a lot. And this is very good. This, this is very efficient for us. If we, if we are able to find a, such a situation that uh, in one branch, we can get some little progress and in all other branches, we can get a, a big progress. This is very good. Mm. And from the second case, uh, we have a, a different intuition that when we want to solve independent set and we are able to disconnect our graph uh, in some cheap way, then this is very good because I can uh, recurs to those connected components of the remaining graph and each of those problems is, is solved independently. So this is very good. This, is, uh, this allows to design a very efficient algorithm. Uh, good. Mm. Oh, sorry. Mm. Okay something didn't refresh correctly. Um, let me point out that the existence of such a sub-exponential time algorithm uh, shows that there is something happening here, that this case is indeed different than the case of other graphs H, uh, but this is not a substantial evidence that this problem should be easy. And uh, such a substantial evidence came uh, not a very long time ago. Um, and this is a, a quasi-polynomial time algorithm by Peter Gartland, Gartland sorry, and Daniel Lokstonov. And this is uh, scheduled to be presented at Fox this year. So it's uh, it's an arc. It's uh, it was available on archive in in July, I guess, or maybe in late June. But it's uh, not published yet. It's uh, accepted to Fox. Um, and they showed that for every fixed t, the problem can be solved in time um, n to log cube n. So this is uh, the same as log to four n. And now let me point out for for those of you who are maybe not so familiar with uh, comparisons of such algorithms that, um, that this is really a huge step forward. This is really 
much different result than the sub-exponential time algorithm. So when we try to imagine the spectrum of all running times, we have polynomial time algorithms and polynomial is n to, mm, to some constant. So I can write it this way. So this is two to log n. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, I have exponential time algorithms. So I can solve uh, independent set by brute force enumeration in time two to n. I can do it a bit smarter. I can improve the constant, but, uh, but it's still uh, two to some linear function of n. So this sub-exponential time algorithm, it's two to little o of n. In our case, it's two to root n log n. So it's better than exponential, but it's still almost exponential, I would say. But this Q poly algorithm, it's two to O of log to constant n. In our case, it's log to fourth n. So, um, so this uh, it is not only about improving this function. It's it's really a qualitative difference, and uh, the reason of this is the following. Imagine that we are able to show that uh, independent set is np hard in p. 100 uh, free graphs for some large value of 100. And so what does it mean? Uh, this means that we can uh, start from, for example, free set with n variables. And we have a polynomial time reduction that transforms this free set formula to an instance of uh, independent set in P100 free graphs. And the number of vertices here is like uh, n to whatever, to 1,000 or 10,000. It's a polynomial time um, algorithm. So the instance is of polynomial size. But look, when I now I apply this algorithm of uh, Gartland and Lokshtonov to here, and when I use the power of logarithm on this n to 10,000, I get, I still get something of uh, like uh, log n of order log n. So this, if I would able to show that the problem is np hard for some fixed t, then this uh, quasi polynomial time algorithm would give me a quasi polynomial time algorithm for free sat and for every other np hard problem. So we don't get this type of corollary from sub-exponential time algorithm because um, when I have n to 10,000 and I take square root of n, it's, it's still larger than n. But uh, logarithms are very nice because they, they kill polynomial functions. Uh, so this is, uh, I, I want to point out that this is really, in my opinion, it's, it's a very exciting result. And it's a huge breakthrough because it's, it's not about improving this, uh, this running time. It's really, really a huge step forward. Mm. Then with uh, Michał and Marcin Pilipchuk, um, we tried to understand this proof and we tried to understand what's going on. So the, the algorithm is, is really simple, but we somehow felt that this is not the right way to say it, to express it. At least this, is, this was not the way how we are thinking of it. And we were able to find, uh, it's basically the same algorithm. We found a simpler, in our opinion, simpler exposition of this algorithm, which uh, yields a slightly better running time. So we shaved off one logarithm here and the proof is three pages long or two pages long. So what I'm going to show you today is uh, is this uh, algorithm here. So it was uh, to be, it was accepted to um, to Sosa this year. Uh, okay, 2001 actually it's in. So Sosa, I don't know if you heard, it's a, a, con a symposium on simplicity and in algorithms. So. Mm. Okay, uh, so so far so good. Are we still together? Excellent. Mm. 
May, may I ask a question? Yes, of course. Just to be sure, all this uh, page is on PT free graph, right? Yes. Okay. Just yeah, yeah, I'm uh, I'm focusing on PT, and T is always a constant for me. I yes. do somehow I hide the dependence on T somewhere in this O. This dependence is it's it's not huge, but it's uh, we didn't try to optimize it. Uh, sorry, there is something uh, okay. I cannot. There is something uh, weird happening. Sorry, I cannot uh, start a new. Page. Okay, doesn't matter. Good. Mm, okay, so let me uh, go to the proof. Mm. Uh, so I will create uh, some kind of uh, buckets. I will create some containers that I will call buckets. So I have a bucket which is associated with every pair of different vertices of, of my graph. Mm. And what do I put into a bucket? I put, so B U V is a collection of all uh, paths. So P is uh, an, an induced U V path. So um, in to my bucket, uh, that is uh, indexed by a pair of vertices, I put all induced paths that join those two vertices. So um, let us uh, think of those buckets a little. Uh, the first thing is that uh, the buckets are small. So uh, this is because my graph is PT free. So all uh, paths, all induced paths are short of length at most T minus one. So the size of each bucket, actually the size of all buckets uh, together is bounded by n to t minus one. It's polynomial in n. And I can enumerate, I can populate those buckets uh, in, within this time. I can enumerate all t minus one element sequences of vertices. I can discard the ones that do not correspond to any path. And uh, if some, uh, sequence corresponds to a path, I just put it uh, into the right bucket. Uh, so this is one important property. So I will use those buckets to track the progress of my algorithm. Mm. The second important property is that uh, those buckets mm, show me the connectivity of the graph in the sense that if a bucket is uh, non-empty. This means that U and V are in the same connected component, of course, because there is a path between them, but also the other way around. If U and V are in one connected component, there is a path between them and the shortest path is induced. Mm. Are in same connected. Mm. So how I'm going to use this, I will go, I'm going to observe the sizes of the buckets and notice that if some bucket becomes empty, this means that I have disconnected the graph. And as I mentioned, when I was uh, showing the previous algorithm, disconnecting the graph is, is something I, I really want to have because this makes my problem much easier. Mm. And how I'm going to uh, disconnect the graph? I'm going to do branching. I'm going to use very similar branching as I uh, did before. So let me prove the um, following lemma. Um, there exists the vertex W. Uh, it's, sorry, it's uh, not there exists a vertex W um, such that for at least one over two T and choose T pair, pairs UV. So for this, uh, this coefficient here, it's not that important. It's not so important that it's one over two T important. It is important that this is a constant. It's uh, because T is a constant. So 
uh, it's important that this is a constant fraction of all pairs. And for a constant fraction of all pairs, mm, the set, the closed neighborhood of W intersects at least uh, one over T. Okay, I will maybe I will write and then I will comment it. So again, this one over T is not that important, but important is that this is a constant fraction. So a vertex W has the property that when I remove uh, this vertex and all its neighbors, for many pairs, for a constant fraction of pairs, a constant fraction of paths disappeared from the buckets. So the buckets shrinked multiplicatively. And uh, how do we prove it? Well, it, it actually follows from the separator theorem that I mentioned to you. So let's take the set X. So this is the set given by the separator theorem. Uh, sorry. Theorem. So we know that X is of size at most T and we know that uh, G when uh, I remove X and all uh, its neighbors and then all components of size at most N half. Mm, sorry. Uh, so this is N half. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean that uh, all components are of size and half? My graph was connected in the beginning. And after I removed this set, my graph got disconnected. And uh, even more, it got disconnected into small pieces. So uh, when you do the counting that, uh, OK, I'm not going to show it, but because it's not that interesting, it shows that uh, if all components are small, it means that many buckets are, are empty. Because when I take a, a vertex from one component and the other vertex from the other components, uh, their bucket is empty. And since components are small, uh, many buckets uh, are, uh, are empty. OK, but uh, x is uh, small. So OK, so uh, let me maybe, mm, so this means that uh, for at least one half over uh, of this pairs, n of x intersects uh, all paths in BUV. Uh, in yes, in BUV. And, but as I said, X is of small size, S is of, of size at, at most T. So there must be a vertex uh, of T that contributes to at least one over T fraction of those. So there is a vertex here that for at least one over two T times this many pairs. So one over two T fraction of pairs UV, uh, its neighborhood uh, intersects one over t fraction of paths. We can think of it that we look at those buckets that are intersected by n of x, and for each path, we color it, we, we mark it with the name of the vertex whose neighbor or, or the vertex itself removed this path. So since I have at most t different labels, there is a vertex who has at least one over t fraction of uh, all paths. Who, uh, at least one over t fraction of all paths are labeled with this guy. And so let's call him dominator. And now when we look at this one half of all uh, buckets, uh, one over t of them must have the same dominator because there are at most t dominators. So this is exactly my vertex. Mm. Let's call it heavy. Uh, so I will call this vertex heavy. Mm. Let me just remark that I can find this vertex in uh, polynomial time. Because uh, how can I do this? I can just enumerate all buckets 
I can look at every single vertex and its neighborhood. I can check the paths. All the objects that I'm working with are of polynomial size and there is a polynomial number of those objects. So I can find this heavy vertex in polynomial time. Of course, I could probably do, do something smarter, but since I only aim to, uh, I, I don't really care about the constant. I, I really, I, it's fine. It's, it's sufficient that it's polynomial time. Good, so what can I do with this uh, heavy vertex? I can do uh, the following thing. So this is my algorithm. Sorry, sorry. Hmm. My algorithm has three steps. Step one, if uh, the number of vertices of G is at most one, then return uh, V of G. If, okay, if I aim for the size of the independent set, then I can remove, return this. If I aim for the independent set, I can just re return the single vertex or, or no vertex at all. Uh, so this is uh, trivial, this is clear. The second step is the following. If G is disconnected, uh, then uh, call algorithm for each connected component. And of course, I re return the sum of the instances. Yeah, my graph is disconnected. Uh, so the largest independent set is the union of largest independent sets in, in those components. So again, this should be uh, clear that this, this is a safe step and the last case is if G is connected and has at least two vertices. I find a heavy vertex using the previous lemma. I know that it exists and I branch on it. And uh, by branch on it, I mean exactly the same as, as I meant when I presented the sub-exponential type um, uh, algorithm. I call my algorithm twice. In the first branch, I decide not to include W in my solution. So I remove W from my graph and I have my little progress. And in the other branch, I decide to include W in my solution. I remove W, I remove all its neighbors and uh, as I will argue, as I will argue in a moment, this will give me a huge progress. So again, we have the same situation. We have one branch that is not very good and the other branch that I will uh, show uh, that is very good. And that's all, that's, that's the whole algorithm. Um, so first notice that, okay, of course it terminates because every time I call my algorithm, I call it for a graph with fewer vertices. At every step, I remove at least one vertex. As also, it is very, I hope it is clear that it re returns a correct answer because I, I'm not doing anything clever here. I'm, uh, uh, there are only two rules. The first rule uh, going to disconnect to disconnected components is I hope uh, very clear, uh, branching as well. So my heavy vertex either is in my solution or is not in my solution. I consider both cases, I return the better of them. So, so this clearly leads to, to me discovering the optimum solution. So the only thing that uh, is not obvious is uh, the complexity. Mm. And I'm not going to show a detailed complexity analysis. It's not difficult, uh, but it's a bit technical and not that exciting. I want to show you um, just a, a very high level idea. So we can imagine uh, my algorithm as a, like the execution of my algorithm as a recursion tree. So this is my tree. Um, so, each node of this recursion, so this is recursion tree. Each node of this recursion tree is corresponds either to 
branching into to, to calling the algorithm uh, for the, uh, each component separately or to the branching. So uh, the components, the nodes that uh, correspond to branching have two children. The nodes that correspond to uh, disconnected to call on a disconnected graph can have more children than two. Mm. So let's say that, okay, I will define something that I will call a local subtree. Mm, a local subtree consists of those nodes uh, that treat a graph of at least 99% times number of vertices in root. So each of those calls corresponds to uh, to some uh, some call of, of each of those nodes corresponds to some call of my algorithm. Each of them is associated with this graph. And let's say that a subtree is local if the size of the graph does not uh, decrease too much. So I can partition my uh, tree into mm, those uh, subtrees. I can do it in a, a greedy way. I don't really care. Um, so I know that within each of those blue trees, the size of the graph is uh, at least 99% of the original size. But as soon as I leave um, uh, the blue part, I know that the size dropped. So the crucial observation is that on each path from root to a leaf, Mm, I visit log and local subtrees. And I think this is clear because uh, every time I leave a tree and I enter a new tree, the size of the graph drops uh, multiplicatively. So it can happen at most log n times, log logarithmic number of times. And what happens within the local subtree? Within the local subtree, I, mm, I can have some uh, branches that I can have some nodes that correspond to disconnected graphs, but uh, they are not that important because um, still the largest component, uh, still those graphs are, are, are large. Uh, but uh, most, okay, the, the important part are the uh, nodes that correspond to, to, the, to this branching. And I know that in one, Mm, branch, I uh, remove one vertex, and, but on the other hand, uh, but in the other branch, I remove uh, the heavy vertex and its neighborhood. I define something uh, that I will call me. So this will be the measure of the size of my instance. And it will be the sum of mm, logarithms of sizes of buckets. Mm. So this plus one is only to make sure that I don't take logarithm of zero. Mm. So the first thing is notice that uh, at the root, uh, my measure, well, I have n squared mm, pairs and each bucket is of size uh, n to t. So I, could, I take the logarithm of it so at the root, uh, the measure is upper bounded by uh, n squared times log n. So this is the, the largest value that I can get here. And what happens when I do the branching? In one branch, as I said, I remove very little, but in the other branch, I, for a constant fraction of pairs, I decrease their buckets by a constant fraction. So this means that if uh, the base of this logarithm is uh, chosen correctly, uh, this means that for a constant number, constant fraction of pairs, I get an additive decrease in the measure here. So mm, in this successful branch, 
uh, and by successful, I mean when I decide to include the heavy vertex, the measure drops by something of, oh, sorry, I ran out of the board. Mm. of the order n, um, n squared. Once again, so uh, I have a constant fraction of pairs. So this is my n squared. And for each of those pairs, I have some, uh, some progress. And uh, I, I am in the situation that I was uh, before in the sub-exponential time algorithm. So this means that I can have, I can execute the successful branch at most uh, log n times. Mm. So, uh, of course, I have those uh, failure branches, I have those nodes that correspond to disconnected graphs, and I'm somehow uh, sweeping this under the rug because uh, it's not that important. Um, uh, because, uh, as I said, we, we still treat the graph that is very large. So, if the vertex is, if, even if the graph becomes somehow disconnected, if the largest component is super large, uh, the vertex that is heavy for this largest component will still be heavy for the whole graph. So uh, when you check it carefully, uh, we can show that uh, the depth of this tree is also log n. So we have logarithmic number of local subtrees, each of depth log n. I, have, I can have the width of this tree uh, n. So this all adds to Mm, to my complexity n to log squared n. Um, so this is the algorithm. Mm, I think I have 10 minutes left. So I would like to announce uh, or maybe uh, show you some ideas for the extensions of this algorithm. Mm. So first, um, we can easily adapt this problem to solve uh, free coloring. Um, and uh, the complexity of free coloring in PT3 graphs is also an important open problem. It's the second largest or, or maybe equivalently important open problem in the area. So, um, and uh, how can we do it? We, again, we, can uh, somehow mimic the sub-exponential time algorithm that was available before. So I, I'm not going to show it in the detail, but the idea is that I can track my progress. I can, I can think of solving least free coloring. So each vertex has a, a, a subset of one to three as its least. And I'm asking uh, if there is a solution and I can track my progress by measuring the sizes, the sum of sizes of those lists. And um, I, well, so I can assume that each list is of size at least two. Because if I have a size, a list of size one, I can just uh, color this vertex. I can propagate this choice of, of the color to the neighbors. Uh, and I can remove the vertex. And uh, if I have uh, two element sets of three element set uh, of three element, two element subsets of a three element set, uh, they always intersect. So I can choose a color and I, instead of branching on choosing a vertex or not, as I did for independent set, I branch on choosing the color or not uh, for this particular vertex. Uh, and this is the same heavy vertex as before. And well, I don't remove uh, the neighbors, but I reduce the sizes of the lists of, the, of its neighbors. So I can uh, track the progress in this way. Mm, so this was already known before, but uh, a very new and uh, very exciting extension is that we can do feedback vertex set in the same way. And actually we can uh, solve uh, something much more uh, general. So, so the theorem 
that we proved uh, actually we finished writing the proof yesterday or day before yesterday uh, is the following if g is uh, pt free and has uh, n vertices of course and then um, in time n to log squared n we can find uh, say largest but uh, here of course uh, this also works for the weighted version i just said largest not to introduce any more notation about weights but uh, set s uh, such that um, g of s is of three with at most k where k is a constant and um, g of s satisfies some uh, formula so i have some uh, cmso2 formula so so i can solve plenty of problems this way uh, using more or less the same approach mm, let me just mention one more generalization uh, so we also consider the class of graphs that exclude mm, long cycles so let's write it c more than t free so those are the graphs that do not have induced cycles of uh, size larger than t so on one hand they generalize pt free graphs because if you don't have a long path then certainly you don't have a long cycle on the other hand you can have long paths without having a long cycle so this is a strict superclass um, finally they could be seen as some generalization of chordal graphs so chordal graphs are graphs that do not have cycles of size larger than three uh, induced cycles of course so so this could be seen as some kind of relaxation of this notion and we can have the same statement for this class of graphs with a slightly worse running time so this is log to fourth n and the very high level idea of this algorithm is, is more or less the same, but uh, there are some more technical details. And um, how to prove it? I, I don't have time to, uh, to show the whole proof, but um, a simple way how, to, how we can think. So let's say we want to prove, uh, we want to solve a feedback vertex set without all this uh, logic stuff. So how does my solution look like? Uh, well, uh, it's each component. Okay, sorry, I'm not thinking about feedback vertex set. I'm thinking about max induced forest. So this is a complementary problem for feedback vertex set, uh, but this is the way I'm looking for it. So I'm looking for the largest subgraph of a uh, sub subset of vertices that induces a forest. So each component is a forest. Uh, so uh, the important property here is that since my graph is pt free, the depth of this four, uh, the uh, the depth of this tree is bounded. It's uh, say a t. Mm. So for each vertex, I can assign some role. So I I can think of looking not for for this uh, uh, graph for for a union of uh, trees but i can think of some role assignment when each vertex is assigned uh, either the so what is a role is either a level in the in the solution so if it be belongs to some tree uh, then it is at some level so i i can have one zero one two up to say t or or I can have a special role that I that the vertex is killed, uh, removed, and I have certain uh, relations between those roles. So, for example, if I have a vertex at position i, then I know that it, it has a, exactly one neighbor with at with role a minus one it can have a bunch of guys, uh, a bunch of neighbors with role i plus one, 
but it's non-adjacent to anybody else. So basically, I do very similar thing as I did for this uh, list free coloring, but now instead of lists of colors, I have lists of roles. So I, I guess the role for a vertex, I propagate this choice, I forbid some roles to the neighbors. Mm. It's a, okay, it's a bit more complicated than I'm saying because uh, I need to keep track. Okay, I, uh, so if I have a guy of uh, role I, I know that it can have at most, at exactly one guy with role I minus one. So uh, we cannot ensure this just by forbidding something in the list. But actually when I guess the role of this guy, I can just guess all vertices uh, in the path from this guy to the root, because this is a constant number of vertices. And when you plug it to this uh, branching, uh, it still solves to what we want. Mm, so this is the very general idea how this is solved. Actually, it's, it's a bit more complicated, especially when you do this uh, logic part. But if you aim for feedback vertex set, this, what I showed here should be sufficient. Okay, so I think this is a good moment to, to finish and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for your talk out today. That's a very nice talk. Are there any questions? <laughs>